at Greenfield Rails Labs, let's scope this to my personal experiences, and maybe it applies elsewhere as well. On Greenfield Rails Labs with a small-ish budget, less than a million dollars, you know, 200,000 to a million dollars, uh, based on whatever types of criteria are involved, there's a choice that's made up front, and that's to use essentially no JavaScript or all of the JavaScript. And I think that's a problem because I'm personally not psychic, and I don't know if I need all of the JavaScript or none of the, none of the JavaScript on a given problem. Um, I prefer to be able to pivot at any given point and respond to what's actually going on. So, make this a little bit more concrete, example of nothing. Server side, rendered Rails app, using something like jQuery with jQuery plugins. So, stuff, the server is sending down HTML, you might be tweaking that HTML app back a little bit. You might have some more complicated components, but they're off the shelf. They've been built for you. The all approach, you're doing a bunch of stuff, a technical term, a bunch of stuff in the web browser. Routing, rendering. Uh, this is often referred to as a spa, especially in the Microsoft world. Uh, that's not always like a like a super accurate term, but it works in our case. With the nothing approach, um, the web page gets built pretty quick. Uh, DHH's original uh, blog in 10 minutes, blog post, video, was a thing that worked like, with Rails. Uh, using nothing fancy, you can stand up a blogging engine in about 10 minutes using scaffolding. Maybe a, a few days if you're actually crafting you know, each route by hand and not using the generators as heavily. Uh, but they're cheap. If you move that responsibility to the front end, You've got a lot more state. You've got a lot more code, and you've got more problems. A nothing approach has a limited user experience. There is typically a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio between user actions and page loads. You click a link, you get a new page. You, sub you submit a form, you get a new page. Uh, with, the except with the exception, of course, of any of the widgets that you might be including. The all approach gives you unlimited user flows. Anything that you can imagine that the browser can pull off, you can do when, when you are using that all approach. With a nothing approach, HTTP is simple, right? Our sources of state are what? The URL. Originally it was just the URL, then we got the session, so now it's URL and hopefully just user identity and whatever's coming back from the database and Redis and Mongo or whatever else you have hooked up to your, to your app. But the bottom line is the same. With HTTP, you get a request and the result is text. It's an easy to understand programming model. So no matter how ugly that Rails app is, the fundamental truth, hopefully, is uh, I just realized I need to talk to Jones to see about some of his war stories. Uh, the fundamental truth should be, uh, you know, URL in, text out. It's a little different with front-end JavaScript because infinite things can happen on top of that URL and text out. Uh, so by definition, that exact same user flow 
if you were to build that using an all approach, right, where you click a link and you get a new page or something that looks like that, it's just going to have more moving parts. Um, I've talked to multiple consultancies that have been sued because they were so over budget because of the technical decisions they made. Because up front, they, just, they decided to take an all approach and they were just unable to deliver on what they on what they promised. Uh, and the more people I talk to, especially the more non-JavaScript people I talk to, um, these most of these JavaScript problems, and they're not really JavaScript problems. They're they're fun. They're problems fundamental to just having more state, and more moving parts, right? But JavaScript developers like writing JavaScript. I love writing JavaScript. And you can solve a lot of the problems caused by writing JavaScript by writing more JavaScript. So oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like violence or, X, or XML, right? Like if it's not working, you just use them more. So when I'm talking to React developers or JavaScript developers, I, I don't hear a lot of pain points necessarily. What I hear is, um, like, oh, well, I didn't quite do this wrong. I've got a bit of a mess. I'd have to refactor a thing before I can ship. Whatever, whatever, whatever. When I'm talking to these React developers, coworkers, and managers, and this doesn't have to be React. Like, I'd have the exact same conversation with the, with the, the managers of the backbone developers, too, right? Um, that essentially they they've got a department that's a black that's a it's a feature request black hole where where they'll ask for a thing and it's just like you don't, you don't even get an echo back right it's like it's like feature requests can't escape the event horizon of a large enough front end JavaScript code base you know, if if you do it wrong which is apparently the default. Which, by the way, um, just to see if I can go back here, um, the thing that, that I occasionally do okay is that third bullet point, which is to help large teams get their velocity back up. Uh, but it's just not something we have at Table XI, which is why I needed to pivot with my skill set. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Uh, we discovered that if we cut back on the amount of JavaScript we wrote to as little as possible, suddenly uh, it was much easier to keep our small to medium sized projects in budget. So just to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, you know, to start with, uh, developer development and design, they have to work together, right? Steve Jobs' quote is, design is how it works. So if you're working without design, you're shooting in the dark, I'm sorry. Do your best, use a piece of paper, right? Um, draw rectangles, so that might be design for you. But regardless, work with design, even if design is your favorite piece of rectangle with, with uh, rectangles. And identify those user flows that are critical to the business, but can also benefit from, from some dynamism. So for an e-commerce website, that could be the checkout flow, right? Um, however, for that same e-commerce website, that might not be like a fancy recipe finder unless you've proven out that that is a critical user flow. Uh, so you have to make sure you're justifying the expense of these pieces of dynamic UI. Um, and then you get to building the thing. So you take the most important dynamic user flow, and you build that with an automatic view library 
I'm going to define that in just a second. You build the rest in Rails, right? Like even parts you think might become dynamic in the future, you just start start them in Rails, right? Because estimation, you just don't know if you're going to have the budget to finish everything you want to start as a dynamic flow. So just start with that one dynamic flow first, right? And then afterwards, validate. You know, get this in front of users, make sure that it's working, make sure it's worth the investment, make it a little bit better. And then when you're go ready to go on to the next feature, you just take the, the second most important user flow that could benefit from, from some dynamism, and you move that from Rails to that automatic view library as little as possible. And you just keep repeating this over and over again until you run out of either budget or the patience of your managers, right? Like at some point, ideally you'll hit diminishing returns. Uh, and these are the steps that we took to ship uh, a site called the Spice House. And uh, we were able to, I'm pulling these stats uh, from memory, which I believe is in my, the ass region. Um, but I believe uh, after we, so we concentrated on search and the cart. The cart first and then search and then a few other areas. Uh, the cart was a big, chunky piece of JavaScript. Search was a smaller piece of JavaScript. Their cart abandonment rate dropped by 80%. Cart size increased by 50%. And uh, uh, not response rate, but um, the non-direct mail term for response rate. The people that, that do the thing you want on the website. Help, help me out here. What conversion? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Conversion rate increased by twenty freaking percent. Just, just by following these steps. And don't get me wrong, we were still over budget because we were kind of figuring out this process as we we're going. Uh, but since then, we've been consistently hitting budgets and improving the lives of our clients. And it feels really good to kind of. Yeah, stumble on a process that works so well when <laughs> so few processes in our industry seem to do that. 